Igual tengo que darle algo. No, no, no. Grabar y emitir ideas. Ok, good morning, everybody. There is a micro still open. Voy a, a grabar ahora, Gerardo. Oh. Okay. Igual tengo que darle algo. No, no, no. Waiting. Grabar. Ok, thank you very much for, for being here. And welcome for this uh, new seminar. Uh, today, we will have uh, the very nice uh, talk by Gerardo Garcia Moreno from the Instituto de Astrofísica Andalucía. And he will talk about, is it possible to simulate time machines in a laboratory? Uh, Gerardo Garcia Moreno studied uh, physics at the University of Complutense in Madrid. Uh, between 2015 and 2019, and then the master in theoretic, theoretical physics at the uh, University Autónoma de Madrid. During this time, uh, he get over uh, of uh, a number of uh, scholarships and um, uh, summer uh, scholarships also in the uh, Institute of uh, Fundamental Physics, then in the Institute of uh, Theoretic, Theoretical Physics, uh, both of them at SSIC in Madrid. And then uh, in the uh, Institute of Photonic, Photonic Science in uh, Barcelona. Then he started the uh, PhD here at the Instituto de Astrofisica de Andalucía in October 2020 under the direction of Dr. Carlos Barceló, uh, Dr. Carlos uh, Luis Garay from the Complutense, and Raúl Carvalho, uh, currently at the uh, University of Odense in uh, Netherlands. Uh, then uh, he has the um, scholarship for doing the PhD. So thank you very much, uh, Gerardo, for giving this talk. And I'm sure it will be very interesting and I will be here. So the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Rene, for the nice introduction. So uh, as you've said, today I'm gonna be talking about whether it's possible to simulate time machines in a laboratory. So first of all, let me give you a brief outline of my talk. Since today is the first time that I publicly speak in the IAA, I'm gonna give a short introduction in which I will talk about the things that are uh, my research lines and, the, and my scientific activity to give you a, a taste of the things I work on. And then I'll jump on the, to the last three items that I showed there, which will be the main part, my main talk today. First of all, I would like to talk about general relativity and what is the status of uh, time machines in general relativity. I will discuss uh, whether these things are possible or not, what uh, do we think, what the community thinks about it. Then I will jump to discuss analog gravity, which is a research program in which we try to reproduce gravitational phenomena in laboratories, which is this uh, second item. I will briefly explain why we are interested on it and the things that we can learn about physics and gravitational phenomena from it. And then finally, I will discuss, uh, after this two introduction of these topics, I will discuss uh, our last paper that I did with Carlos and other collaborators on whether it's possible to simulate these time machines there. So first of all, let me introduce myself. And I'm uh, my uh, research line is high energy physics. I'm a high energy physicist. And I'm interested in understanding high energy physics. Because of special relativity, this means also very short length scales. And actually I'm interested in uh, putting together gravity and uh, quantum field theory, which is essentially what the theory that describes particle physics, the standard model of particle physics. And in doing that, uh, we don't have reached yet the energy scales at which quantum gravity is expected to be relevant which are essentially uh, 10 to the 19 giga electron volts or in length scales, 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. But in any case, we think it's uh, uh, useful to think about um, the kind of uh, uh, imprints on low energies that this kind of uh, quantum gravity theories that uh, 
uh, are relevant at high energies may have at low energies. In a sense, I'm not interested in any kind of particular approach toward quantum gravity. I don't do a string theory or I don't do quantum gravity, but I care about what are the uh, physical consequences of these things. How can we measure uh, things that come from those theories. Also, one thing that is characteristic of what we do is that we pay a lot of attention to condensed matter physics. physics. This means systems that you can engineer in the laboratory and uh, draw, uh, draw up conclusions and learn things that we can uh, infer from those, from the behavior of those systems with respect to quantum gravity. And actually it will be uh, uh, what I will be talking today. But before that, let me uh, tell you that uh, essentially there are two situations in which we expect uh, gravitational phenomena to be intense enough or strong enough to, to, to quantum gravity, for quantum gravity to be relevant. One of them is cosmology, the very early universe. I won't discuss much about that today, but the other one is uh, black hole situations. Actually, we don't, uh, I don't study much black holes, but what we call black hole mimickers. These are things that look like black holes in the sense that they reproduce the electromagnetic and gravitational wave observations that we have of black holes, but instead they don't have the pathological behavior that general relativistic black holes have. For instance, they are not singular and they don't have event horizons. So within this context, you see here a, a bunch of things that I'm working on now. Uh, first of all, we are revisiting the famous no hair theorems of uh, general relativity. This means in general relativity, black holes are supposed to be characterized just by how massive they are and how fast they rotate. But uh, when you move, you depart from general relativity, you study modifications that can come, for instance, for instance from quantum gravity, you soon uh, break this no hair uh, theorem. So we are understanding how you can break them and what are what things survive of these snow hair theorems. Or we are studying bouncing models in which instead of forming a singularity after a star collapses, you stabilize an object, maybe after a little bit of uh, oscillations and all that. But uh, this is the way in which you would form this object. This means it could not collapse until you have a singularity. And also I'm interested in, uh, in how these objects could have a differential uh, accretion behavior from black holes or uh, how uh, you can jet, uh, launch these uh, ultra relativistic jets that uh, uh, these black holes that we observe in AGNs, because it seems to be a different the mechanism that acts on this kind of black hole mimickers than the one that acts in ordinary black holes. Also another topic which is more related actually is the topic of my talk today is what happens when you push the uh, the causal conditions of general relativity, the structure of causality that you have in general relativity to its limits. This means essentially I'm uh, at very short uh, scales. We think space times are Lorentz invariant, but from many quantum gravity approaches, we expect Lorentz invariants to be violated. And just here I've put some items, which are the tools that I use every day, just in case sometime uh, you hear about them. These are the things that I, uh, fight against every day, effective field theories, quantum field theories, and all that, which, I, which is the way in which we describe Lorentz invariance violations. Actually, today I will focus especially on, on this superluminality. Once you break Lorentz invariance, you can send superluminal signals. And I will focus on the problems that appear when you have superluminal signals, because it's very easy uh, to engineer a time machine when you, once you are allowed to send superluminal signals. This is something that I'll discuss a little bit later. So uh, just as a, as a remark, uh, the interest in analyzing this issue of the building time machines is not just because it's funny per se, but uh, in the meantime, when you try to uh, build uh, these uh, time machines, you're pushing your theory to, to its limits and you might be probing a more microscopic and fundamental structure that appears uh, in nature when you try to do this. Even if you don't manage to build it, you will be testing uh, nature to scales uh, that you wouldn't test in, in another way. So in this talk, I will focus on condensed matter physics, physics which can be done uh, can be uh, realized in laboratories and the issues of uh, that appear when I have superluminality. 
So this finishes sort of my introduction for you to know what I work on. And now I'll jump to the main part of the talk and we will first discuss general relativity. So first of all, a question, who's here familiarized with general relativity? Please, hands up. Come on, Victor. <laughs> okay, hard audience. Um, so let me just briefly review what's uh, general relativity. I will begin with the basics. What's the kinematics of general relativity? Space-time in general relativity is described as a curved uh, manifold, which is a very fancy mathematical word, but you think you can think of space-time as a curved surface. This means take a, take a piece of paper and fold it. That's where space-time is. Light rays in that folded space-time follow the straightest, you can exchange this word straightest by shortest, possible paths in, uh, in this surface. This is the basic kinematics of general relativity. This we encoded mathematically in a metric, which is this object G mu nu that I'm representing there which is a tensor and all that things. But equivalently, you can think that this G mu nu is encoding the light cones structure of this uh, surface at each point. This means if you zoom one of these uh, squares enough at sufficiently short scales, uh, every space time looks like this. Looks like time flowing in one direction, space in the other, looks approximately flat if you zoom enough. And you have at each point, at each point P that I'm writing here, a light cone. Actually, you have two, the future light cone, which is depicted in green here, and the red light cone, that is the, the past light cone that is depicted in red there. The locality principle, which is underlying general relativity, tells us that you, we can send just information within this future light cone, just between the borders of this green cone. Actually, the closest you send this information to the boundary of the cone, the fastest information is is moving uh, to the future. So this is a crucial point. And in my talk, I will be using this kind of code color for the light cones all the way. So for you to remember, I've chosen to, to, <laughs> to put these two uh, pictures in which Kermit uh, ran away for the Spanish speakers. We represent the things that we can do. I mean, we can go in that direction. Kermit is gonna be trying to move uh, to the future always. And we have also this uh, Red Panda from the recent film Red that uh, has anyone here seen the film Red? Okay, I expected those that had kids to have seen it. <laughs> so I'm not sure if the film is about this, but I'm pretty sure it is. It's about a Red Panda that gets very angry when someone tries to go back in time, right? Thank you. So that's the argument of the film. So whenever we do fancy things in my talk today, we do things like go, trying to go backwards in time, this red panda will appear telling us that we cannot do it. So now that I've discussed the kinematics of, uh, of uh, general relativity, it's time to move and discuss uh, the dynamics. Essentially, the dynamics of general relativity is encoded in Einstein equation, which are these things that I've written here. We have the left-hand side, which is the uh, Einstein tensor encoding the uh, space-time curvature, telling us how much curve is a space-time at a given point, and the right height, which tells us the energy density at a, at a given point. This means the energy, essentially, uh, that we have. So in that sense, Einstein equations simply relate how much energy is there at some point with how much curve is the space-time at that point. From this perspective, uh, the curvature can be equivalently thought, it's a very nice pictorial way of thinking about it, as a tilting of the light cones. Whenever, this, uh, whenever we don't have a gravitational field, as I depict here in the left uh, lower picture, the light cones flow normally to the future. Whenever we have a gravitational field, this is what that D in the left, in the right uh, hand side represents, the light cones tilt. And actually the closest you are to the object emitting the gravitational field, the more tilted the cones are. As I told you before, this, uh, uh, the closest you move to the, to the uh, border of the light cone, the fastest you move to the future. So if you are closer to the border of the light cone, when you are closest to the object, time flows for you uh, more, much, sorry, much slower than for someone that is very far 
from the light from the uh, surface of the object. This is exactly what happens in, in the film Interstellar. In Gargantua, you have your light cones. When they go down, very, very tilted. So this is essentially uh, what happens in Gargantua. And also these things uh, are required to be used by your GPS uh, <laughs> for you to not get lost. So um, now it's, uh, this is a little bit a uh, departure from my talk, but I thought it was interesting to illustrate with this picture of the light cones what an event horizon is. This is a, a star, a spherical star. I'm just drawing here a circle because obviously I cannot draw uh, uh, more dimensions in a paper. So this star is collapsing until it forms a singularity at that point. And this gray shaded region, region is uh, essentially uh, what we call the black hole. It's the black hole region because the light cones tilt so much that whenever uh, you um, are parallel to this event horizon, uh, uh, the locality principle tells you that you need to flow into the gray shaded region. And for you, it's not possible to escape to the white region. So in a sense, a, a black hole is essentially something with a gravitational field so strong that the light cones has, have tilted so much that you cannot escape from that place. So uh, within this context, one um, may try, uh, well, yeah, they won. <laughs> uh, sorry. So uh, within this context, we can think of a CTC. This stands for closed time-like curve. This means a curve such that the light cones are always flowing to the future and an observer can stay at a given point, go through this loop and come back to the same point without violating this locality principle. This thing, you can conceive a geometry, you can write down examples in which this occurs. And essentially, uh, this is what would represent time travel in a sense, someone coming back to the same point, to the same space-time point. Uh, of course, this is not problematic from the point of view of locality because you're always flowing within the light cone, but it's weird. I agree that it's a weird situation. However, we have solutions like this in general relativity. This means some things that solve, uh, some geometries that solve Einstein equations and display this behavior. For instance, uh, the most famous one was probably by a mathematician uh, called Kurt Gödel, which is one of the greatest mathematicians in the 20th century. And they display this behavior. However, it's not, it's not so interesting for us because it's not something that we experience in our ordinary lives. We are not plagued by uh, time travelers. So we are more interested in having a space time which has a normal uh, causal behavior. And at some point we manage to generate just uh, one of these CTCs and then time flows again. Uh, I'll put a picture in a moment. So this situation occurs in general relativity but it's not so interesting for us. Uh, let me just now uh, discuss uh, something that I mentioned in the introduction, and it's how superluminality and time travel are uh, very related. Special relativity is okay for people here. Okay, so imagine that I have two reference frames, this one in, with the axis in blue, Tx, that I represent there, and the other one with the axis in red that I represent there. Let me call this one S and the other one S prime. And as you see, because of the uh, because of the twisting of the uh, of the axis, this one is boosted with respect to the blue one. This means there is a Lorentz transformation relating them. And imagine that we are able also these dotted lines represent the light cones at each point. Obviously, imagine that I'm able to send superluminal signals. This means that instead of flowing within the uh, interior region of the light cone, I can go send signals. Uh, outside it, okay? So this in principle is something that I'm allowed to do. So send a signal from this point to P prime, which is the origin of the other uh, frame of reference. Now an observer that is lying here is for him or her, it's also possible to send superluminal signals. This means that he can send signals within this region of the light cone and this region of the light cone. And the issue is that the unique constraint that he needs to fulfill is that it goes to greater to uh, uh, positive values of T prime if this is T prime equals zero. And this is fulfilled by this second trajectory that I draw here, which goes to the past of the point T. So in this sense, it's possible for these observers 
to send, uh, like to engineer time travel, essentially, because uh, this one is sending information to this, this one is sending back to his past, and in this way, you've managed to send information to your past. So this happened with super, superluminality, just as an aside to become relevant later. As I was saying before, the kind of situation in which we are more interested is the one in which we have a normal time flow and at some given bounded region of our space time, we are sort of engineer this kind of ear that we glue to the space time. And this ear is a, a time machine. This means that it has trajectories that go backwards to the same point and then go to the future. In our standard, in our knowledge of general relativity and a standard, the standard model of particle physics, uh, it's possible to do this. It requires negative energies, which are something that is uh, uh, tightly constrained. We cannot manipulate at will these negative energies, but theoretically it's possible to conceive a situation, a future, a very advanced civilization or something like that, that is able to do it. So uh, for that purpose, I'm gonna tell you a story about uh, someone that tried to do this, which is Kermit, the frog that wanted to time travel that I'm putting it here for you to see it. So this is the story of Kermit. Kermit was a very happy baby frog that grew up and became a, a, a high school student. So at some point in his life, he decided that he wanted to uh, uh, engineer a time machine. He wanted to be a time traveler. So he decided to study physics. He struggled with math, but he passed his exams and he became a graduated Kermit the frog. So, uh, oh boy, how fast they grow. So um, this Kermit the Frog uh, wants to engineer machine. So essentially he is able now that he knows a lot of physics and he manipulates at will uh, negative energies and all that, he's able to engineer this time machine. And now he wants to use it. So he travels through the time machine. But now we have a problem. Imagine that this uh, Kermit becomes evil in the time travel, comes back to the point to this point and wants to kill the older Kermit. So we have a problem. This, <laughs> it's like the, uh, the kind of problem, this kind of uh, grandfather paradox in which uh, you kill your grandfather by using a time machine and you were never born. So imagine now that we have a third Kermit, uh, many Kermits, and essentially he completely becomes completely mad after all that. So someone is getting angry at this point in my talk because we are doing things that should be illegal. For instance, if we time travel back and Kermit kills his uh, elder, uh, sorry, his younger version, how the hell could, sorry, how can he travel back in time? This is why the red panda is angry. Essentially, uh, this suggests that this time travel is very pathological and we have to take carefully uh, consider it. And essentially, uh, <laughs> Uh, there is a, a principle of self-consistent histories. This means that you cannot have this kind of setups in which you travel back in time and kill your younger version. Uh, well, since I'm using the Muppets, I want to be family friendly and that's why I shouted that. And I will describe the example with a billiard ball. Imagine that there is a billiard ball here that goes in this direction, goes through the loop and finds the previous uh, billiard ball here but it hits it and deviates it from the trajectory. This is another kind of paradox that may appear in this situation. So one has to avoid that, but let's assume that we have avoided it. Furthermore, there is a second problem. The time machine is engineered with negative energy. Every time that our Kermit travels through the time machine, since it's positive energy, you can check it if you want. Uh, uh, it will generate an instability. It will try to destabilize this time machine. Also, every time that it goes through the loop, it will interact gravitationally back with the Kermit that already uh, was uh, the younger version of Kermit. And in that way, they will generate gravitational waves. So these gravitational waves will run through the loop. Each time it runs through the loop, it adds to the existing gravitational wave, it'll travel again, and in that way, it gets amplified. So this seems to be very unstable. So it seems that our Kermit, poor Kermit, cannot time travel at this point. But he still wants to make a time machine. However, even if you don't travel through the time machine, if you don't use it, uh, there is an instability due to quantum effects 
uh, the quantum vacuum, you can never turn it off. And a good way of thinking of the quantum vacuum is essentially as particles and antiparticles that are created and destroyed all the time. You should think about vacuum in that way. And this is something that is allowed by uh, Heisenberg uncertainty principle. You can violate energy conservation, but just on very short time scales as permitted by this bound. And when you do it, uh, it's possible that these particles propagate through the time machine again, very short time scales, but propagate there and destabilize the machine. The machine. All these observations on how hard is to engineer a time machine uh, led Hawking to uh, conjecture his famous uh, chronology protection conjecture, in which uh, he surely uh, says that uh, time machines should be forbidden by the laws of physics. There is still a gap in all this, and it's uh, that the considerations that I've been doing apply until you reach this Planck scale at which quantum gravity effects uh, become active. So in a sense, at that scale, we don't have any idea of what space-time looks like, and things can just uh, be very different. So at least for macroscopic scales, those that our Kermit needs to time travel, uh, we cannot uh, uh, engineer this time machine. And essentially, we enter uh, the regime of quantum gravity in which we cannot say much about this. So uh, we have that our red panda is happy because we are not uh, doing uh, chronologically uh, forbidden things. And our poor Kermit is very sad because he hasn't been able to time travel. And also he had a friend that wanted to invest in a time tourism agency, but uh, it doesn't be, seem to be a very profitable business. So poor Kermit. Okay, so, oops, I should, that's in Spanish, I don't know why. Uh, okay, so at this point, I'm going to move on to the next part of my talk in which I will describe analog gravity. And essentially to do it, I will use this analogy. Imagine this river is a fluid essentially, and these fishes uh, attempt to represent uh, sound waves propagating on top of this fluid. Imagine there is a point, this point of no return, such that the fishes move with a speed of sound much smaller than the velocity of the fluid. This means that all these fishes that are from this point on to the waterfall uh, would essentially be dragged by the, by the fluid. So they cannot escape. But this is precisely the same thing that happens when you have a, a, a black hole. But instead of a black hole, it would be a dumb hole. This means uh, this hole cannot speak in a sense. Uh, the analogy is as follows. These sound waves are essentially like light propagating on a black hole. This fluid is essentially playing the role of the substratum, the means uh, where these sound waves propagate or this light propagates. This means it's the effective space time that we have. And this black hole is essentially replaced by uh, this, uh, this kind of uh, hole that cannot speak. To pretend that I'm a theoretical physicist, I will now put some equations. Uh, this one is wrong, actually. I leave you as an exercise to notice where it's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is the equation that describes sound propagation. So this is in flat space-time. This equation is from uh, your undergrad studies. So I won't go into details, but let me move on to what happens when you have sound in a curved space-time. I've written this equation here for those of you that understand it uh, uh, great. For, you, for those of you that don't understand it, I just want you to notice that here appears this G, this square root of minus G is essentially the determinant of this matrix, this G mu nu matrix. And this G mu nu matrix essentially uh, encodes the, instead of the light cones, since we are now describing sound, the sound counts. This means uh, at each point of space time, it tells you on what direction can uh, sound propagate. It is related to the properties of the fluid. For instance, this row represents the density, this C, the local speed of sound, and this V, the velocity of the fluid. So essentially, this is the way in which we can uh, describe sound propagating on curved space time. And this is this second equation is the way in which it relates to the substratum that we have to the kind of fluid on top of which it is propagated. So all of this of analog gravity for what, you may ask. 
Let me just discuss a little an example of the success of this analog gravity program. And for that purpose, I'm gonna tell you very fast about Hawking radiation. As I told you just a couple of minutes ago, uh, it's possible in vacuum that particles create and destroy continuously as allowed for the, by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Imagine that this occurs very close to the horizon, to the event horizon of a black hole. One of the particles may fall and the antiparticle can escape to infinity. So someone that is sitting very far, like Kermit from the black hole, will perceive a flow of particles. Actually, uh, if you can perform the detailed computation, it's a, a thermal spectrum with a temperature which goes, roughly speaking, with the inverse of the uh, mass of the black hole. Uh, here, I am putting h bar equal one, c equal one, maybe pi equal one also. So uh, the issue is that when you plug real numbers here, you plug, for instance, a solar mass black hole, uh, this temperature is ridiculously small. It's orders and orders of magnitude much smaller than the CMB, than the microwave background. So there is no hope to measure this thing on uh, astrophysical black holes. But uh, in analog gravity, we have the same ingredients that we need to, to be able to uh, have Hawking radiation. This means it's possible to simulate geometries that have a behavior like that of a black hole. And essentially, uh, we can measure, uh, and we can try to measure this on a setup like a laboratory system in which we can control all the parameters of the theory. As many of you have said many times, astrophysics is not experimental, it's observational. This means that you cannot reproduce the conditions that you want a lot of times to perform an experiment. So this is a benefit for analyzing this Hawking radiation. Essentially, this was a proposal that was done in the 80s, but then they realized that the standard fluids are very dirty. This means there is a lot of noise, so you cannot measure Hawking radiation there. But then the 90s came, people discovered post-instant condensation, and uh, someone very smart decided that it's a good idea to use this post-instant condensation, these quantum fluids, which are much more clean, since you lower the temperature until uh, micro Kelvin, nano Kelvin scales, uh, they are much more clean. There is not a lot of noise there, and you can try to use them for this analogy. You do it, and there was a proposal in the in the 2000, and some years later, well, these are Bose-Einstein, the standard picture of a Bose-Einstein condensate, and some years later, later, uh, Steinhauer uh, was a which is a researcher or an experimentalist was able to measure this Hawking radiation in 2000 axis C. So this is one of the successes of analog gravity, something that we cannot study in astrophysical scales because we are limited by the kind of observations that we can make and the scales that we play with can be reproduced in a laboratory and you can get a lot of information from there. So given this, uh, I hope this motivates why I think it's interesting to study analog gravity. And now I come to the work that we've been doing recently this paper that was submitted to the archive, which is uh, uh, the electronic uh, preprint version uh, in January of this year. So this was a work that was done with Carlos, which is sitting there, and uh, Joaquin and Jill, which are collaborators. Actually, Jill did his PhD thesis here like 15 years ago, maybe. Okay, so 13 years ago. And uh, we've done this work. Essentially, we tried, since uh, in this kind of analog gravity setups, superluminal dispersion relations are something that usually appears, we thought, okay, so we have superluminality. This is enough to build a time machine. Can we build a time machine? So this is the idea of this work. Actually, we, we thought we couldn't probably do it. But as I said before, it's interesting to, to check to push your theory to the limit. So let me take a step zero and tell you something about closed timelike curves that will be relevant later. A closed timelike curve is one such that uh, uh, your time coordinate can be used as periodic. This means uh, you have this point, you go through the loop, and when you come back to this point, obviously you need to identify this coordinate to be a good coordinate, like an angle. When you rotate two pi through a circle, you need to identify back this phi. Uh, so 
Essentially, a closed timeline curve, a space-time containing one, is such that you have a time coordinate which is periodic. This is something that will be relevant later. Uh, second, let me make a very stupid observation, which is that in one plus one space-time dimensions, this means uh, one time and one space, uh, I, don't, I no longer have a kind of light cone in the sense that I just have two legs representing the direction in which information can flow. Uh, whether I call these two directions, the vertical directions time and the uh, horizontal ones uh, space is a convention. I could essentially do the same with replacing time and space. This is a very stupid observation and it's relevant for what I'm going to say now. Imagine that, I'm a, that I tell a, an experimentalist that is a friend of mine to put a fluid on a circle. A circle that evolves with time, the fluid propagating on that circle, on a ring. So essentially, from the point of view of, uh, of, uh, of a space-time, this is a cylinder because it's a circle plus time. What the experimentalist would do is say, okay, I have a configuration of the fluid on a ring, this pink uh, ring that I have at a given time. My time flow is flowing upwards. So essentially, uh, what I will do is make a perturbation here and analyze how it evolves to the future. The issue is that if he's very, uh, uh, I don't know, if he doesn't feel right that day with working with a ring, that experiment can be equivalently explained as follows. Imagine that he uh, puts the fluid on a line and lets it evolve it and evolves it in a, period, in a way such that it is periodic. This means in time, it's a periodic signal because essentially he just has had, well, he just had decided to call uh, the outer part of the light cone what uh, uh, time instead of following this convention here. This means it's, uh, as if the light cones were completely tilted. So this very stupid observation is simply to tell you that uh, these are close time like curves, but they are very stupid and trivial close time like curves and are equivalent to this kind of uh, uh, time like eternal time like curves that we have in that I described before. For instance, these ones. These ones that pass. Okay, I have to go a lot back. This one. Uh, this one that passes through every point. So essentially, this kind of close time like curves can be simulated in a laboratory, but they are very. Uh, I don't know how to say it, uh, stupid. Again, in that sense that they are simply a matter of an experimentalist doing fancy things. Now, let me go to the most interesting case for, for us and for Kermit, which is uh, engineering a chronological horizon. So what's a chronological horizon? As I said before, a chronological horizon is somewhere where you have, it's the boundary of the region that causally behaves well. This means you have an ordinary space time. At some point, you engineer a time machine. And that point at which you engineer the time machine is a, is a chronological horizon. This means, uh, from the perspective of, uh, of coordinates and how we describe this, there is a, the, this chronological horizon corresponds to the place at which an angular coordinate, which is phi, for instance, an angle, becomes a time coordinate. In the same way that what happens at the black hole is that uh, time and space exchange their nature, here happens also uh, something very similar. Uh, this phi coordinate, this space coordinate exchanges its role and becomes time. So essentially in matrix form, this is represented by in the ordinary situation, we have that the metric has a negative sign for the T coordinate of this GTT component and G phi phi is positive. When you go to the chronological horizon, this becomes zero. And actually, when you go beyond it and you go to the region in which you have uh, uh, time-like curves, this becomes negative again, meaning that uh, an observer that is moving along those directions is not violating locality. So this is a chronological horizon. Now it comes to the point to see what happens in an analog gravity setup in which you essentially uh, want to identify these components of the inverse metric, which is the equation I wrote before, the sound cones are identified with physical parameters or system. For instance, the velocity of the fluid, the sound speed, the density, all these things. You essentially can do the math. And since I don't want to annoy you a lot, you end up finding that velocities, for instance, if you are using an analog system 
which is a fluid, become infinite. The velocities, the speeds of sound. If you are using an optical analog, which means uh, the electric medium, you will essentially find uh, divergent permittivities and divergent uh, susceptibilities and all that. So this essentially tells us that if someone wants to engineer a uh, time machine in a laboratory will, will not be able because he will have to have infinite fluid velocities. For instance, an example is one geometry that we studied, which was a, a version of Gödel geometry that we sort of modified in order to have just uh, uh, a chronological horizon and closed time-like curves from a point on. This means not eternal closed time-like curves. And whenever you try to do this, you find that the velocities uh, of the fluid and the sound speeds get divergent. So <sighs> unfortunately, the answer is no. We cannot engineer time machines in a lab. So let me just conclude. Uh, the messages that I want you to take home. First of all, whenever you he hear black hole mimicker, compact object, quantum field theory, Lorentz invariance violations, it's me, talk to me. So the second one is uh, in general relativity, close time like curves seem not to be a, a, a possibility, macroscopic ones at least. So uh, uh, time tourism uh, is not a good business. The second, the last ones are strictly related to the work that I've presented. Essentially, um, the first one is that we can simulate these eternal closed time like curves, but they are trivial. They are, they are actually harmless. They, they are, we don't care much about them, but we can simulate it just in case someone is interested on them. And the very interesting case for us, which is simulating a chronological horizon, which is building a time machine, something that we cannot do. So, Unfortunately, uh, the answer is that we cannot build it. And finally, I just want to emphasize that this is not just a, a, a sci-fi thing, which, is, which it is also, but the aim of studying these things is not just that uh, you might one day be able to time travel, but the issue is that uh, when you prove uh, the scales at which you need to prove physics to make a time machine, you are actually unraveling the structure of your space time. Uh, what happens in the fluid, for instance, is when you go up in the velocity, you will end up noticing that your fluid is no longer a fluid. So imagine that we are able to try to build a time. I mean, it's no longer a fluid. You resolve the atomic and molecular structure of the fluid. If we do the same with uh, ordinary time machines, we may end up finding what's the nature of space-time itself. So this is uh, one of the things uh, that we need to further investigate. And this is all. Thanks for your attention. Kermit uh, acknowledges you for coming. <laughs> okay, thank you, Gerardo, for this uh, nice talk and for all your efforts to make uh, accessible to everyone these uh, complicated concepts by using analogies, kermits, and pandas. <laughs> That's really fun. So the, the session is open for questions. Uh, for the people in Zoom, please uh, raise your hands virtually. And for the people here, raise your hands uh, physically. So don't be shy. OK, we have uh, one question here in the room. So. Ah, I speak to the microphone. Yeah. OK. Um, Thank you for the talk. <clears throat> I hope I would understand something. Let's see. Uh, my question is related to the loop, where you see the, the, that time machine building in space time. Can you show the, yeah, the picture? That one, yeah. Uh, I was wondering, the space time through the loop is the same one as in the previous part before making the time machine, or is a complete different space time? due to the, you said it, we require negative energy. So applying Einstein equation, the metric is going to change, right? Okay, thanks for the question, Borja. Uh, actually, the issue with space-time is that uh, uh, you need to see as a holistic thing, as a whole. This means that the space-time is the whole thing with the year and everything. The issue is that uh, typically what you do is not think of the space-time as a whole, but just having one slice, this means you cut 
uh, through a constant time surface and then evolve that. That's what you typically do. So in a sense, the space-time as a whole is the evolution of this uh, surface that you evolve. And uh, yes, the issue is that you need negative energies at some point to engineer this time machine, but uh, the space-time is something as a whole. I don't know if that answers your question. So it would be a perturbation in, in the structure of the metric. So how do you represent that part? I was trying to wonder. Representing? Oh, yeah. How, how can you connect, let's say, physics in that part of the loop with the other thing? Because you're not having the loop, for instance, in the left part. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it, it happens too, I mean, at the same place or just where the, I don't know how to call it, where you have locally negative energy. Is that a thing that I don't understand? I mean, this is a, a local part in the space time where you have negative energy or as a whole. Yes. Yeah, sure. Okay, now I understand your point. Here in this region in which you glue the ear, actually in the region in which you glue it, that's where you have negative energies. In this part, you don't need to have a negative energies. So I don't know if that's okay. Einstein equations here have a dimmu nu that has negative energies, and here you can have whatever you want to have. But that's, uh, I don't know if that answers your question. Okay, sorry, I didn't understand. Any other question, either in Zoom or in the room here? Okay, don't be shy. Later, you will not be able to travel back in time to, to ask questions, so <laughs> do it now. No one in Zoom or here? Okay, then let's thank Gerardo again. So thank you for, for your talk. Um, thank you for the Okay, so, and we are closing now the, the session. I think, Rene, you can stop recording. Okay.